Murder Puzzle is a phrase I surprisingly wasn't aware of when playing Dishonored, nor Arcane's new shooter Deathloop, but when their campaign designer Dana Nightingale mentioned it, I can't describe these games as anything else. It is of course a game of murder, but through an immersive sim, the way around that murder is a puzzle box in the player's hands, with multiple ways to reach its destination. This begs the question, who builds this box? With a successful launch in the background, I spoke with Dana about Deathloop, its heritage with Dishonored, and how they designed the game's multi-stage time loop. I also grilled her about some of my favourite visionary locations, which you can find in a second video. For now, I wanted to know about her job title. How do you design a campaign when there are no real levels, nor any concept of linearity? <sighs> how do we even begin? The big, the big challenge uh, for, uh, of Deathloop compared to something like Dishonored is that in in Dishonored you can afford to be a little myopic when it comes to the campaign because every single like chunk of the game, every level could be its own little isolated game. You you go into you know ed Edge of the World or Clockwork Mansion or Crack in the Slab. That is a game right there. So if if that that content is very inward focused, if it's not connecting very uh, explicitly to everything else in the game if there isn't a very clear through, through line it's it's kind of okay you can get away with it every level designer can be their own director this is their content this is the story they're going to tell and it's more it's more episodic like like this is this episode of this series it has its own arc it has its own characters but that's not how deathloop works at all deathloop is one entire cohesive experience and like we we realize that the person who is designing this murder puzzle that is that is a full time job that's not something that can be uh, you know you you delegate that to twelve people um, and maybe one person is the owner of it but everyone's kind of just doing their own thing and you hope that it syncs up it was not going to work that way there really needed to be one person who was the the author of this who was the one creating the design and then working with each of those individual people. And um, what I didn't realize when I started doing this was that I was going to have to also do become a, a, a UX specialist overnight. That was not something I had any experience in. Of course, that's a position that requires like tons of training. That's not something that you just, you know, read up on on a weekend. So I had to, like my, my background is in level design. And there's a bit of UX in that too, but the level of, of, of UX design that I had to become fluent in very quickly, and like, but I say very quickly, I mean like over the course of six months, I had to like really get up to speed on like, like what, what are the tenets of good user experience design? So that, that is where uh, my collaboration every day with our, our UI UX team came in and creating that uh, UI that we have for the leads and the, the arsenals and the discoveries. We were constantly like uh, testing that, prototyping that, iterating on that. So on the one hand, uh, I had to be designing all of the little moments, all of the challenges that uh, the player and cult has to navigate in order to solve this this uh, murder puzzle. And the whole other side of that job was working with the uh, UI and narrative on how are we communicating to the player visually through an interactive interface, what they've done, what they have to do next, figure out exactly how to present it, what, what appears on uh, your HUD when you're in game, when you go into your journal, what do you see? Uh, and that was like, that was a huge learning process for me, but I was very into it. I was very interested in getting more into how does the game as a whole communicate with the player? What relationship is the game building with the player? Like, are, are like, does the player trust what the game is doing? Because they know that the game is going to inform them when something's happened. They're going to, the game's going to communicate something clearly that they, they, they understand. And now they know what to do next. And the game is never like putting up a screen in their face and the player's just like sitting back and going, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what the game's trying to tell me right now. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just gonna wander around bumping into things until I figure it out. It was very important to us that the player and Colt were always in lockstep of, there's a ton of stuff we don't know, 
but I understand what I don't know. And I, and I know where to go to find out and to keep that moving throughout, you know, our, I, I see now on how long to beat, uh, dot com, the, the main story is like 14 hours long, which is just perfect for me. But yeah, over the course of like 14 hours to keep that, that, uh, that curiosity and, but, but it's curiosity driven by, I know what questions I'm asking. And the, the, the UI design was as much a part of that as the level design in this case. So was that always the case? Because I think when people, when I describe death to people, they might run into it expecting this kind of like pen and paper, figuring out this master puzzle for what to do and where to go. Was there more clear freedom? <laughs> How did you say that balance between freedom and like, okay, you need to yes. know what. I'm, I'm, there'll probably be a point where we talk more about this later. Uh, cause this is like a whole like post-mortem GDC talk right here. But early on, there was a version of the game where the game didn't do any of that for you. You, we, we drop you in and you were just on your own. You, you had to find the clues, you had to figure it out. And all of the cause and effect was still there. Like this action led to that, but the game didn't track any of it for you. We very quickly saw that like there, there is one player out of 10,000 who would just eat that up. But for for the for the other you know, ninety nine thousand is just it's overwhelming. It's too much. It it gets lost, and people very quickly lose enthusiasm when you're in a situation where I don't know what this game is asking me to do. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to get more game out of this game because like, I'm just I'm just going in 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 circles, um, and the game isn't progressing. And you know this this is like. You know, pre-alpha, this is still deep in production, and we realized that this version of the design isn't going to work for this type of game because it still is first and foremost an action adventure. It has a detective element, it has a puzzle element, but we need something so that the player feels like the game has their back and they they can trust that the game is always going to like give them the nudge in the right direction. While creative control, consistency, and showing things clearly to the player counts for a lot, I wanted to know about the source of the murder puzzle. How do you literally design this twisty time loop series of objectives? We started off working on whiteboards, but um, you know, then, then the lockdown happened, so <laughs> I, okay. it, it became instead pages and pages and pages of PDFs with just flowcharts, and I would spend hours and hours every day updating these flow charts. Um, and the combined challenge there is, if I can't communicate my idea like this, then it's not gonna work in the game. Because if I can't communicate what I'm thinking to my colleagues via this you know, work from home situation, there's no way it's gonna work for the player. So it was almost like the, the first barrier um, to like prove that the idea works was, can I effectively sell the whole team on it from this work from home situation? Um, so maybe in that way it, it helped because you know you're not in a in a meeting room and, and brainstorming and in that context I think it's a lot easier for the ideas to flow. This is all very much more disconnected. You know, the, there's a lot of like hidden moments where the the story can become nonlinear, where you can skip to the middle of a lead or or like solve the lead in one try if you figured it out. And to make sure all of those worked and everyone understood them, and we took this into account, and this is taken into account. It's a lot of a lot of uh, you know export to PDF, put it on the put it on the server, let everyone know it's been updated, and and uh, just cross your fingers that it'll work in the game. A main feature of Deathloop is times of day, with morning, noon, afternoon, and evening hosting different vibes and objectives for Cult. Messing with something in the morning might affect something in the evening, and so forth. I wanted to know the process and challenges in designing the same world of Black Reef in four different ways. Uh, it really forced us to think about how the, t the four time zones could be different. The four times a day could be different. We wanted each one to feel fresh and novel, but also like it's it's not it's not like you're visiting four different dimensions and it's like you know now now near now this is the fire age now this is the water age it had to be a progression through time and it was it's only hours apart so we couldn't do drastic changes and it was a, this is mostly was um on, on on the shoulders of our art team to solve uh, the level designers were were involved for certain but 
the artist would really carry the burden of, okay, this is now five hours later. What can have happened between then and there to make the layout of the map different enough so that this is now a, this now feels like a new map? Uh, I was less involved uh, in that process. I was much more focused on um, like like situations like the the um, the fireworks workshop that burns down. That's something that I was very closely linked to. But things like uh, you know you see. There was a drag race on Freestead Rock sometime during the day, and you see the setup for that, and then the aftermath of that, or the concert in uh, in, in Updom. You see them preparing for that, and then after the concert, when everything is trashed, or you know, cars that have broken through buildings and so forth. Um, most of that was was dreamed up by by the artists, and what a huge challenge it was for them. But but oh my gosh, they, they did such a great job. When playing Deathloop, you can't help but notice the DNA of Dishonored stitched throughout it. Health and mana look similar, there are similar abilities, and some environmental design with vibes of Dunwall or Kronaka from both games are there too. But it made me think of the opposite. What did Arcane want to do differently with Deathloop to set it apart from the rest? We, we really wanted to make a game where the player would stop being, would stop feeling afraid to experiment with our systems. Our, our previous games really pushed the player towards perfection, uh, for better or for worse, which is a way that, what, that I like to play. Um, but the, the big question hanging over a lot of us was, what, what does our game look like if the player has to live with every mistake that they've made? Uh, and, and we know because like we're, we're developing the game. We're not, you know, you don't even design the save load system in a game until like the last fourth of development anyway. Like that that's something that comes very late. So we're playing the game for years without save load. So we know what the game is like if you just have to live with all of your mistakes. And we really wanted uh, the, the players to be able to embrace that, but also feel good about it. Uh, and that's where a lot of the comparisons to um to Moon Crash. Uh, comes in because th these two projects were really started independently. We we didn't even necessarily know what the other team was doing, but we were both coming from the same uh, problem that we wanted to solve of how does somebody play an arcane game if we take away the perfectionism from them? Now they're just, they're, their experience is going to be as chaotic as our games thrive on, like like these these simulations thrive on chaos. That had to be something that we constantly thought about because a level designer could get really comfy in the idea that if this just goes wrong, they'll just load their game. So that's okay. So you can just have uh, something really punishing and unfair because it doesn't matter because the player just loads their game like, to, to five seconds ago and they do it again. We couldn't design like that anymore. Everything had to be designed from the standpoint of failing this should be as fun as succeeding. Hey, thank you for watching. We interview interesting folks in games media and development often here on Overload, so make sure to subscribe for more and hit like on this video while you're at it. If you want more, a new video with Dana is coming soon where she reveals various secrets about my personal favorite Visionaries storyline. Stay tuned for that very soon.